guys and welcome back to the PyTorch tutorials. In this video we're going to talk about the loss functions. Since there are a lot of functions under the PyTorch neural network package, we're going to devote one video to cover most of the loss functions associated with our course and then in the next video I'll do the same as the gradients video and show you the implementation of the different kind of losses. So first let's define loss functions. Loss functions measure how close a predicted value is from the actual value. For example if you have an input data to a neural network and you have predictions which are shown as y-pred. This is going to be the predicted output from our model. And let's say we have y, which is the target value associated with the input data. Then the loss j can be computed by finding the difference between the prediction and the target values. So the basic function or use of a loss is just to make the predictions as close as possible to the target values. So loss functions guide the model training process towards correct predictions. It is a mathematical function or expression used to measure a data set's performance on a model. There are three types of loss functions in PyTorch. The first one is a regression loss function, which deals with continuous values, which can take any value between two limits. Regression loss functions are uh, loss functions which are used for uh, regression models. So the output from the prediction, the output from the model or the predictions are going to be continuous instead of discrete values. But classification is the opposite of regression, in which the output from our model is discrete values and it does not deal with continuous outputs. For example, if you want to make a prediction for a stock in the stock market, that might be an example of a regression, a linear regression problem. And if you want to differentiate between an email which is spam and not spam, then that's one type of classification problem. And the loss that deals with classification is known as the classification loss functions. So image classification into two labels such as cat and dog is also a classification problem. Another subset of loss functions are known as ranking loss functions, which predict the relative distances between values. An example would be a face verification where we want to know which face image belongs to a particular face. So we're not going to be concerned about the ranking loss functions for this video. Our main concern will be the top two, which are regression loss functions and classification loss functions. PyTorch has plenty of built-in loss functions and these are found under the torch.nn package. Some of the loss functions used in PyTorch are the L1 loss function, which is also known as the mean absolute error loss. Second one is the mean squared error loss. Third, we have the negative log likelihood loss, then uh, cross, uh, cross entropy loss, or it's known by a different name known as categorical cross entropy loss, and also binary uh, cross entropy loss. These are also other losses which are found under the neural network module of PyTorch, but they're not going to be it's not going to be under the purview of this video. 
First, let's start by explaining some of the regression losses used in PyTorch. The easiest kind of regression loss is known as L1 loss or mean absolute error. It measures the numerical distance between the estimated and actual value, and it is the simplest form of error metric. So, if you define x as y hat or y prediction, uh, we are using a different notation than uh, which is used uh, in most of the cases. Uh, we use y hat instead of x, but for now let's just assume x is a predicted output and y is our target value. Uh, we use the notation x mostly for input data. So we take the difference between the output from our model and the target value and we take the absolute value that is known as L1 loss. The absolute value of the error is taken because we don't uh, because we don't want the negatives to cancel out the positives. For example, when you take the difference, some of the losses might be uh, negative and other losses might be positive. So if y pred is less than y then it's going to be negative and if y pred is greater than y then it's going to be positive. So when you have positive and negative losses and when you sum them in the case when you have multiple losses then they're going to cancel each other out so that's why we put them under the absolute value the lower the value of the mean absolute error the better this model so the primary purpose of a loss function is to minimize the loss so that the prediction from our model is as close as possible to the target values we cannot expect its value to be zero in the case of L1 loss because it might not be pract practically useful and this leads to wastage of resources. So even though the loss is not going to converge to zero as long as it's very small, uh, it might be enough. So when to use L1 loss, the first one is for regression problems. Uh, the second one is for simplistic models and as neural networks are usually used for complex problems this function is rarely used we cannot implement the L1 loss for complicated models such as neural networks and we only implement them for regression problems such as um, models that predict continuous outputs specifically in those cases where target variables contain outliers. So uh, when you plot the input data to your model, uh, you can see that s uh, some of the target variables may contain some outliers. If that's the case, then the Elon loss might be preferred. It is robust for handling noise. The next uh, kind of loss, regression loss, is L2 loss, or it's known as the mean squared error. It computes the square difference between values in the prediction tensor and that of the target tensor. So the L1 loss was just taking the absolute value, but in the case of the L2 loss, uh, we're using 2 because we're using the L2 norm. If you have taken linear algebra class, then you might know the difference between uh, one norm and two norm. But if that's not the case, then the L2 loss is just the summation of the square of the difference between the output from our model and the target variable. The squaring of the difference of prediction and actual values means that we are amplifying large losses. So why do we put the square instead of the absolute value? We mentioned that the absolute value prevents the losses from cancelling each other out. So let's say if the difference between our target and our prediction and our target is off by 200, 
then the error is going to be when we, when we square this loss it's going to be 40,000 as you can see this loss is going to be very amplified and if it's very amplified in large then it leads to something known as exploding gradients and we have covered uh, about gradients in the previous video if the classifier let's say is off by 0 0.1 which means the difference between the predicted output and the target variable is just only 0 0.1 then the error when we square 0 0.1 will be 0 0.01 so when you compare the difference between the two it's very large and it's very hard for our model to learn when you have losses that are uh, very large and that are very small so this penalizes the model when it makes large mistakes and incentivizes small errors so we want to incentivize this kind of loss because we want our predicted output to be as close as possible to our target. But uh, we want to incentivize this kind of error, but we want to penalize large errors like 40,000. So uh, we can use the MAC loss under the neural network module and we can use it also for regression problems the numerical value features are not large so the features the input to our model should not be very large and the problem is not very high dimensional which means we cannot use high dimensional features such as images and other types of high dimensional features So we have covered two kinds of regression losses and the smooth L1 loss is just a combination between the L1 and L2 loss. It is also known as the Huber loss. It uses a squared term if the absolute error falls below 1 and an absolute term otherwise. So for the Huber loss, as you can see, if the difference between our predicted output and the target variable is less than 1 then we use the squared error and this is just a constant that we multiply with the L2 loss but if it's greater than 1 then we just use the L1 loss and subtract a constant so why are we uh, doing this? if the mean square error loss in the mean square error loss, we square the difference which results in a number that is much larger than the original number. So we have uh, already mentioned that the mean squared error is going to penalize large uh, differences. And when the difference between the two is less than one, we want to use the mean squared error because since the difference is very small then when we take the square it's not going to cause that much problem but when it's greater than one when the difference between the two is greater than one then we just only want to take the L1 norm because if we square this one it's going to be very large that's why we use the L2 norm for values less than one for small values and we just use the L1 norm when it's greater than 1. So the high values always result in exploding gradients. This is avoided here as for numbers greater than 1. The numbers are not going to be squared. So when it's greater than 1, for large differences, we're not going to square them. It's also used for regression problems. Uh, we mentioned before for the L2 loss we cannot use it for large values but in the case of L1 loss we can use it even for large values because uh, we have fixed the problem of exploding gradients it's well suited for most problems now we have covered the three uh, famous regression losses next uh, we're going to talk about the classification losses
The simplest kind of classification loss is the negative log likelihood loss. It maximizes the overall probability of the data. So uh, we can assume that x is also the output from our model and y is our tar target variable. And we're going to take the negative of the logarithm of the target variables. Or in this case, uh, instead of the target variables uh, here, we're going to use the prediction from our model. So we can just uh, replace the meaning of x and y. It penalizes the model when it predicts the correct class and with smaller probabilities and incentivizes when the prediction is made with a higher probability. So just as we have seen for reg regression problems, uh, when we deal with classification problems, we also want to incentivize uh, the model to make uh, correct predictions. So when it predicts uh, the correct class with the smaller probabilities, we penalize the model. So if it gives us smaller probabilities when the class was correct, then we have to penalize the model. And if, if the prediction is made with a higher probability, we incentivize the model. So if we have the correct class and we got higher probability, we want to incentivize uh, this prediction. So the smaller the probabilities, the higher will be its logarithm. So if we put uh, smaller probabilities here, then when we take the log, it's going to be higher again, because the log of a very small number is going to be very high. And the negative sign is used here because the probabilities lie in the range between 0 and 1. So when you take the log of a certain number, uh, then the negative sign uh, is used when the probabilities range between 0 and 1. When the probabilities are very small, the log is going to be high, and the negative sign uh, is used to, to basically penalize uh, the model. And the logarithm of values in this range is negative, mostly, so it makes the loss value to be positive. Uh, the purpose of the negative is uh, to make the log positive. So sometimes when you take the log of a probability, you get a negative value. And when you get a negative value, when you multiply it with another negative, then it's going to be positive. So the purpose of the negative log li likelihood loss is just basically to penalize the model when the probability is very small when we have correct predictions. We want the probability to be high when the uh, predictions are incorrect. So for the case of correct, we want to incentivize predictions with higher probability. And when the probabilities uh, range between 0 and 1, uh, the logarithms of the values in this range is going to be negative. So if you take any number between 0 and 1, then when you take the log, it's going to be a negative value. And this negative, the purpose of this negative is just to cancel the negative for numbers in this range. And mostly the probability predictions are going to be within this range. So it makes the loss value to be positive. The negative log likelihood loss is mostly used for classification purpose and it's smaller with a quicker training and it's used for simple tasks. Next is a binary cross-entropy 
loss which builds upon the negative log likelihood loss and it's a particular class of cross entropy losses which is used for the unique problem of classifying data points into two classes so since these kinds of losses are going to be used for classification purpose if you only have two classes then you're going to use a binary cross entropy loss the negative log likelihood loss was just using the negative of the logarithm of the prediction from our model uh, now the meaning of x and y changed again so it might be confusing but if you understand the basic concepts then that's fine x is going to be our prediction and y is going to be our uh, label in this case uh, labels for this type of problems are usually binary and our goal is to push the model to predict a number close to zero for a zero label and a number close to one for a one label so the labels for a binary classification problem might be either zero or one and we want our model to predict a number close to zero when our label is actually zero and a number close to one when our label is actually one so usually when using uh, the binary cross entropy loss for binary classification problems the neural networks output is a sigmoid layer which is used to ensure that the output is either a value close to zero or a value close to one so one thing you might notice is when you take the log of a certain input it's going to uh, it's going to be a logit or it's not going to be a probability value so previously when we deal with the negative log likelihood, likelihood uh, loss the the y we assumed that it could be within the range of zero and one but if we do not use a sigmoid layer or a sigmoid function on the output from our model this is not going to be guaranteed between 0 and 1 so that's why in the case of a binary cross entropy loss the xn uh, here in this case is going to be a value ranging between 0 and 1 if we implement a sigmoid layer before passing the the logarithm function so this is basically the entire binary cross entropy loss uh, you can ignore this term for now but this is a weight uh, that is used when you have unbalanced data sets but for now uh, just we are just concerned with the negative and the term which is inside of the square brackets the yn uh, is used for labels uh, for the label one and if you use the label one then this term is going to be gone and when you replace one here the only thing left will be negative log xn which is basically the same as the negative log likelihood function and if your label is zero then this term will be gone and one minus zero will be one and the only thing remaining will be the negative of log of one minus uh, zero and this is basically going back to the negative log likelihood uh, loss but you're just using or considering the fact that you have two classes so for uh, it's, this is just a basically a piecewise defined function but combined into a one a long loss function uh, when we talk about the logistic regression model we're going to see in detail how we get this formula but for now uh, we just assume that the binary cross entropy loss is derived from the negative log likelihood class 
and it's used for binary classification tasks and for logistic regression problem. Let's assume that we want to predict whether the image contains a panda or not. So this is a simple example which contains an image uh, which has a panda and the other one just says not a panda or there is no panda in this image. So the label for this data might be 1 uh, if there is a panda and 0 if there is no panda. Uh, the first thing that we can do is to convert the target into a one-hot encoding. So let's convert the target to a one-hot vector and our prediction to a prob probability vector. And the probability of panda would be the same as the prediction and probability of not a panda would be a one prediction. So what it's saying is uh, we're just basically converting this a label into a one-hot encoded vector. A one-hot encoded vector is just basically saying if you have a panda then put one uh, on that index and put zero for the not a panda case and if if you don't have a panda then put zero on the first index and put one for the not a panda case. So when training a neural network you can just use the original targets or you can use a one-hot encoded vector but mostly a one-hot encoded vector is used for NumPy, uh, scikit-learn and also Keras packages but when dealing with PyTorch it mostly uses the original target and we will see why that's the case uh, when we go to the next slide. And the original prediction from our model uh, might be 0 0.8 for the case of a panda and 0 0.6 for a case of not a panda. And we can uh, convert this into a probability vector. So for the case of uh, a panda, then the probability, if the probability is 0 0.8, then the other case 1 minus uh, the probability of a panda is 0 0.2, so we, we put 0 0.2 for the other case. And if the probability for not a panda is 0 0.6, uh, then we can just assume that the other case might be just 0 0.4. This loss can be computed with the cross entropy function since we are now comparing just to probability vectors or even with categorical cross entropy since our target is one hot vector. So the cross entropy, categorical cross entropy, and the binary cross entropy functions are basically built on top of one another. So the negative log likelihood uh, might be changed into a binary cross entropy problem when we deal with uh, binary targets and we will see about the categorical cross entropy but basically what this is saying is uh, we can assume that the cross entropy functions are built on, on top of one another so it can also be computed without the conversion of a binary cross entropy. So we can basically convert this binary cross entropy back to the negative log likelihood or we can derive the, even the categorical cross entropy from the binary cross entropy function. And we have mentioned that if this is a prediction if this is a target and if this is a prediction if the target is zero then this term will basically be zero and if the target is one then this term will be gone so you will have a very simplified function uh, that is going to be similar to the negative log likelihood 
So there are some things that we know that we must note about binary cross entropy function before we move on to the next uh, classification loss function. The output of our model uh, may not contain probabilities that sum up to one. So we have already mentioned in the previous slide that uh, the output from our model might be a linear layer and this linear layer is not going to be between 0 and 1. So we must push it inside another function known as a sigmoid layer. And a sigmoid layer is basically a function that squishes the values between 0 and 1. So we put the value that is outputted by our model instead of x, and it spits out a value which is between 0 and 1. And this image contains a dog, so since we have a prediction from our model saying that it's 90% confident that it's a dog, then we can say, yes, it's a dog. But for binary classification problems, the predictions must pass through a sigmoid layer to convert them to probabilities that sum up to 1. And these probabilities must always sum up to 1. But notice that the previous BCE laws uh, that we mentioned when we introduced the binary cross entropy laws from PyTorch is not a stable loss because the predictions are not passed through a sigmoid layer unless we implement the sigmoid function ourselves. So when we code the model, or when we, when we create the model using PyTorch, we have to uh, use the function sigmoid to convert the output from the model before we use it inside our loss function. If we use the BCE loss, because the BCE loss is not going to is not going to be concerned about the sigmoid values. If you just pass the output directly from the linear layer to the BCE loss, this loss may not converge. But PyTorch luckily has another function called BCE with logits loss, which adds a sigmoid layer and the BCE loss in one single class. So if you don't want to be concerned about implementing the sigmoid layer by yourself, you can just call the BCE with logit loss from PyTorch to which automatically uh, converts the input to the loss function uh, to be between 0 and 1 by using the by applying the sigmoid layer under the hood and it is more numerically stable than a plain sigmoid followed followed by a BCE loss and if you just implement the sigmoid by yourself and then use the BCE loss from PyTorch, it's not going to be numerically stable than using a sigmoid uh, function which is uh, incorporated inside the, the module BCE with logits loss. So we can modify the loss function for the binary cross entropy uh, by using the sigmoid function before the prediction from our output. So this sigmoid is just basically saying I'm um, just converting the output from our model to be between 0 and 1 before I use the loss function. If you have more than one, more than two classes, then it's better to use the cross entropy loss than the binary cross entropy loss. Cross entropy as a loss function is used to learn the probability distribution of the data. And it's used for classifying data points for more than two classes. While other loss functions like the squared loss penalize wrong predictions, cross entropy gives a more significant penalty when incorrect predictions are predicted with high confidence. The main difference between the negative log loss 
functions that we have seen previously in the cross entropy laws is that the cross entropy laws gives more weight for the confidence of our model or the predictions from our model. So the cross entropy loss gives a very significant penalty when incorrect predictions are predicted with high confidence or when our model is saying with high confidence that uh, the incorrect predictions uh, are uh, actually incorrect. So what differentiates the cross entropy loss from the negative log loss is that the cross entropy also penalizes wrong but confident predictions. So it might be if it is wrong and our model is uh, confidently predicting, we penalize it more. And if it is correct but has less confident predictions. So it might be worded, but in order to simplify what it's saying is the purpose of the cross entropy loss function is to give more weight for the confidence of our model. So the confidence of our model is basically the predictions from our model, so the probabilities that we get from the predictions. So if we get a higher probability, that means it's getting it's becoming more confident about what it's saying and if you get lower probabilities then it's becoming less confident about its predictions. So if the prediction is incorrect which means our prediction is not matching the target variable the confidence of our model so wrong but confident predictions so it must not be uh, higher confidence if we get a higher confidence for incorrect predictions it will be penalized and also if we get correct predictions but with less confident with less confidence then it's going to be also penalized But the negative log loss function does not penalize according to the confidence of predictions. So it doesn't it doesn't give any weight to the confidence of the predictions when compared to the cross entropy loss because it's a very simple function. In order to use the cross entropy loss uh, in PyTorch, uh, we have to call the cross entropy loss function under the neural network package. And here we notice that we're using the same uh, y times log pi, and we're using the summation 1 up to n for n classes. So uh, we're going to calculate the loss for each class. Uh, the negative log loss function for each class and then basically we're going to sum them together in order to get the final loss. So it's also used for classification tasks and for making a confident model. The model will not only predict accurately but it will also do it will also do so with higher probability and it's also used for higher precision or recall values. Uh, there is also another thing that we must note with cross entropy loss which is kind of similar to the th things that we mentioned for the binary cross entropy loss. Notice that the cross entropy loss function in PyTorch applies the softmax first and then the negative log likelihood loss under the hood. So previously for the binary cross entropy loss, we are only classifying or identifying uh, two classes. But in the case of cross entropy loss, uh, we might have more than two classes. So we cannot use the previous sigmoid layer uh, in order to convert the linear layer into probability values that sum up to one. 
So let's say if you have three classes, the probability outputs for these classes must always sum up to one. So let's say uh, we have a one hotted, one hot encoded class labels, and if you have uh, the predictions or probabilities for the three classes, uh, we we are getting higher confidence for the first class, and it's um, it's also true because uh, we 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 use the index one for the first class. That means our model is. Uh, predicting with higher probability that it's going to be the first class and notice that all of the probabilities for the cre for the three classes are going to sum up to one and in order to convert the output from the linear layer into probability values we're going to have to use a softmax layer and a softmax layer is just basically uh, a different kind of uh, function, activation function, uh, that we use for uh, classifying objects or classes uh, which are uh, more than two. And here we're going to use the exponential function and then here we're going to put the prediction from our model. and. Uh, at the bottom, we're going to sum for the different classes. So this is basically the sigmoid function. But for, for the case of the binary cross entropy loss, we noticed that if we use the BCE loss uh, class, then we don't have uh, we don't have the sigmoid layer being implemented by PyTorch. So we, we changed it into uh, here into the BCE with logits loss so that it could incorporate the sigmoid function uh, before using the output from our model. But the original BCE loss did not have uh, did not use the sigmoid layer. But in the case of the cross entropy loss, it basically uh, applies the softmax layer by itself. So we don't have we don't have another class to do that for us. So whenever you you call the cross entropy loss function, you have to remember that the, there is no need to implement the torch dot softmax layer on the last layer by yourself because the loss function does that for us. So there is no separate uh, cross entropy loss and cross entropy with logits loss. There is just one cross entropy loss used for um, multi-class problem. And it basically applies the softmax layer by itself before using the loss function. So the targets don't need to be converted to one hot encoding when using PyTorch. This is one more thing that we need to remember. When using Keras or other types of uh, deep learning frameworks, we must convert the target variables into one hot encoded class labels uh, before using them for our model. But in the case of PyTorch, when you use a cross entropy loss, you don't need to convert uh, the targets into one hot encoded values. So for example, if the index for dog is zero and cat is one, and then we have another class for uh, maybe another animal uh, like a frog, and we have zero, one, and two, you can convert them into one hot encoded first when using other deep learning frameworks. But for the original targets, you can just use 0, 1, and 2 for PyTorch. And that would be OK. So the things that you need to remember is that there is no softmax in the last layer. Don't implement softmax by yourself. 
way to use cross entropy loss because PyTorch implements the softmax layer by itself. And another thing to remember is Y has class labels. We have to provide the target uh, variable as a class label and not a one hot encoded vector. And the prediction from our model, the raw scores uh, has to be logits. So logits are just the numbers that we get from the linear layer and do not apply softmax by yourself. Now let's see a particular use case for the multi-class cl uh, classification problem. So let's say we have a dog on an image and we want to predict which class is on the image, uh, whether it's a dog, a cat, or a panda. It can only be one of them. And after passing it in our model, we get a probability for each of the classes. So the first one is a dog probability, the second one for a cat, and the third one for a panda. The prediction is a probability vector meaning it represents predicted probabilities of all classes summing up to one. So for a multi-class uh, classification problem, if you convert them into probabilities by using the softmax function, then they will add up to one. So let's say our target is going to be one zero zero because we have a dog on the image and since it's a one hot encoded vector, uh, we're going to turn the index for the dog from 0 to 1 and let the others remain as zeros. And for the prediction, uh, we're going to use the output from our model. Notice that the probability for a dog which is the confidence from our model is higher for the dog class than the, compared to the other classes. The target for multi-class classification is a single one hot vector, meaning it has one on a single position and zeros elsewhere. For the dog class, uh, we want the probability to be one and for the other classes we want it to be zero. So the prediction from our model can be improved as we use multiple iterations and when we train the model for, but for this particular output, it's going to be 0 0.5, but when we improve the model, it's going to be closer to one and the other ones are going to be closer to zero. The target for a multi-class classification is a one hot vector, meaning it has one on a single position and zeros elsewhere. So when we calculate the uh, laws for a particular class, we can use the probability of class X in the target is going to be given before the logarithm. So the target value is going to be P of X and the probability of class X in the prediction is going to be given as Q of X. So basically, this is just a, a uh, the, the logit loss that we have used for the binary case. But here, we're gonna use uh, the simple one and calculate the loss for each class. So this is a particular class X, and this is the target for that particular class X. Uh, for our case, it's a dog. And this is going to be the prediction from our model for the class X. Don't worry too much about the formula. We, uh, we will cover that in a second. Just notice that if the class probability is zero in the target, then the loss for it is also zero. So if the target is zero, then this will be zero. 
the loss will be also zero. But if it is one, then it's going to be the negative of the log of the probability for the prediction of class X. Now uh, we're going to calculate the loss for each class. So first uh, we're going to do it for the dog class because the one is given for the dog. So we can apply the formula, uh, the negative of the target variable dog, which is going to be one. And this is going to be the probability for the dog class, which is going to be 0 0.5. And the log of 0 0.5 is around, it's going to be uh, a negative value. So the purpose of this negative, as I mentioned before, is to cancel the negative term from the logarithm class. And then we have a positive output for the loss, which is going to be 0 0.69. But for the rest of the classes, we, we have already mentioned that if we use 0, then the loss is also going to be 0. So it doesn't matter what the probability is for each of the classes. It's, the loss is always going to be 0. So for both cases, the loss is going to be 0. But for the case of the dog, it's going to be 0 0.613. Once we calculated the loss for each um, class, then the formula for the cross entropy tells us that we must compute the loss for each class first, and then we have to take the summation for the n classes. So we have to take the summation of 0 0.6930 0 and 0, and finally, uh, we have 0 0.693 as a loss for the for all of the classes. So we can formulate the formula for the cross entropy by applying the summation for x classes, p of x log of q of x. Or if you use a different notation, or when you read books, they might use this preferred nota notation, but there, it's basically doing the same thing. Now, we have covered the case of multi-class classification. Now, there is a different problem that we haven't addressed before. That is, what if we have multiple labels in in an image or an input data multi-label classification first we assume that we only had one class per image but what if we have multiple classes inside the image at the same time cross entropy can also be used as a loss function for a multi-label problem cross entropy doesn't have a problem whether you use a single class or multiple classes on a single image. So the target before was 100 zero, zero, and the we used the index 0 for the case of the panda but now it's going to be switched to 1. And the probabilities for both the dog and the panda are going to be higher after we train the model, but for this specific prediction, uh, we have these probabilities assigned for each of the classes. Notice our target and prediction are not a probability vector. It is possible that there are all classes in the image as well as none of them. Sometimes you might have all the classes inside the image, and other times you might have none of them. So it is possible that you might not get a, a probability that sums up to 1 in the case of a multi-label classification problem. In a neural network, you typically achieve by using a sigmoid function for each of the classes. 
So let's see how to fix the problem of the, probabil the probabilities not summing up to 1. We can look at this problem as multiple binary classification subtasks. Let's say we want to only predict if there is a dog or not. So we're going to treat the cross entropy for each class as a binary cross entropy problem. We know that our target is 1 and we have predicted 0 0.6 for the case of the dog. So we're going to replace those values but instead of just using the p of x by log of q of x, we're also going to add the term 1 minus p of x log of 1 minus q of x. So since uh, the value of p of x is going to be 1, this term is also going to be 0 and we have uh, this output. And we do the same for the other classes. For a cat, our target is going to be 0. So the other part of the binary cross entropy cancels out. So when we replace 0 for the case of the cat, the first term is going to be gone. And we just have the second term. And it's going to be 1.2. And finally, for the panda, we also have a 1 because we have a panda on the image and uh, this term is going to be gone because 1 minus 1 is going to be 0 and we only have this term uh, and it's going to be around 0 0.916 finally we're going to sum up the losses for each of the subtasks so we have the binary cross entropy loss from the dog and we have another for the cat and we have another one for the panda which is going to sum up to 2.631 so let's give a conclusion since it's TLDR TLDR stands for too long to read so let's summarize what we have seen up to now for the classification task because we have covered a lot of concepts. The first one that we have covered is the binary classification. We use binary cross entropy as a specific case of a cross entropy where our target is 0 or 1. When we have only two classes, uh, we're going to use the binary classification loss. It can be computed with the cross entropy formula if we convert the target to a one hot uh, vector like 0, 1, or 1, 0 and the predictions respectively. So uh, you can convert the... it can be computed by... the binary classification can also be computed by using the normal cross entropy function but you must convert uh, both the targets and the predictions into a vector so the targets must be converted into a one-hot vector and the predictions must be converted into probability vectors. So this is going to be the target and this is going to be the probability and 1 minus the target and 1 minus the probability on this term. If we use 0, this term is going to cancel and if we use the target 1, this term is going to cancel. So you're basically going to end up with the normal cross entropy function when we cancel the terms. The cross entropy is a general formula which is used for calculating loss m for more than two probabilities, uh, two probability vectors. The more we are away from our target, the more error grows, which is, is a similar idea for the square error in the regression problem. Finally, uh, we address the problem of multi-label classification. So cross entropy is used for multi-class classification, but for some of the cases we might have multi-label classification. Our target can represent multiple or even zero classes at once. 
So we computed the binary cross entropy for each class separately and then sums them up for the complete loss. So we have to perform the binary cross entropy for each class first and then we're going to sum them up together to find the total loss uh, for our model. That's all for today's video. We have covered a lot of concepts and if you manage to get to understand most of the concepts that I have mentioned now, then when I moved when I move to the implementation of these concepts, it's going to be very clear. That's why I need to address them first in a theoretical video, and then when you implement them and mess around with the implementation of these functions, then if you remember the points that I mentioned about the sigmoid and the softmax functions, then it will help you to choose the best loss function for your model. Because a lot of the times people make mistakes and implement the sigmoid layer when they don't have to, or the softmax function uh, when they don't need to, because sometimes PyTorch does that under the hood. Thank you for watching uh, this video and in the next video uh, we will see the entire implementation of all of the concepts using uh, Jupyter Notebook. Audio jungle.